The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea, where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This, as another public service of the National Broadcasting Company, is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Menace of Japan's Old Order. This much is sure. You'll never eliminate the danger of Japan until you eliminate Japan's old order. Japan's old order is the men and the institutions that promoted the war in the Pacific. It is the men who have been running Japan and the way they have been running it. It's the Zaibatsu, the clique of powerful families that have run Japan's industry and commerce for generations. It's the men who shape the government's policies and control the military for the last quarter century. It's the Shinto code. It's the emperor and all he stands for. <laughs> On the day Japan surrendered, a group of young army officers killed a general in command of Hirohito's personal guard, threw a cordon around the imperial palace, and tried to capture the emperor's rescript to prevent it from being proclaimed to the world. This was the old order. We hope that peace will last for 20 years. Then we will be back again. This is the old order, too. Lieutenant General Itagaki at the surrender of Singapore. We have stopped fighting because the emperor asked us to. This is the old order. The opinion of the Japanese man in the street. The emperor is infallible. He decided to end the war to save us from privation and misery. Such is his benevolence. And this is the old order. Regard for the emperor and all he stands for. It has taken years to develop this order. It is in the warp and woof of Japanese life. We have bowed to the enemy's material and scientific power. But in spiritual power, we have not lost. Let us unite and work to bring our nation up as a strong and admirable nation. We have not lost. This is only temporary. This is an expression of the thinking, the point of view, spawned over the course of years by the old order, by the industrial and commercial families, the Mitsubishis, the Mitsuis, the Sumitomos, the Asudas, and the others, by the Shinto Code, and by militarists and bureaucrats, Men like Sadao Araki. The Japanese army is the army of his imperial majesty. It is led by the emperor himself. Sadao Araki inspired the young Japanese to fight to dominate the world. You are the messengers of world peace. His oratory molded them into crusaders for the emperor. If your obedience is achieved simply through the threat of army discipline... The power of the army on the battlefield will never be fully developed. You officers and you men must mutually believe that you are the soldiers of the Son of Heaven. You must believe that the orders issued to you are in reality the expression of the imperial order of the emperor. I talked with Iraqi. He linked the mission of the Japanese soldier directly to the myth of the emperor. Let the fire in you blaze and show you the way. Araki had profound influence in the old order. And so also did Kenji Doehara. Doehara was called the Lawrence of Asia. Let this observer who knows Asia tell you about him. Doehara speaks Chinese as well as he speaks Japanese. He's a smooth, back-of-the-scenes operator. His fort is making friends whom he can use to the advantage of Japan. 
But friendship with Doe Hara has meant death to those he duped. Not by Doe Hara, but by those betrayed. The Chinese knew him well. I saw him once in Mongolia, disguised as a monk. And I saw him in Manchuria, disguised as a peddler. Many people claim to have seen him in many parts of Asia. He worms his way into the confidence of everyone. Officials, soldiers, anyone he can use. He always had plenty of money at his disposal, and he used it freely. In the years before 1931... Dewey Hara took the trouble to learn firsthand all about China and the Chinese. He traveled extensively behind the scenes. In 1931, when he was a colonel, he was chief of the Special Service Division. Special Service. He was the one who engineered the Mukden incident. At that time, he worked hand in glove with Lieutenant General Sashiro Itagaki, who was also a colonel at that time, and with General Toshizo Nishio. Nishio was then in charge of the Army Press Bureau in Tokyo. These were the unholy three. Nishio, Itagaki, and Doihara. The Japanese garrison in Manchuria attacked the Chinese on the pretext that a group of Chinese had torn up a section of the South Manchuria Railway. The Japanese seized Mukden. More incidents developed. Doihara engineered them. And the Japanese occupied all of Manchuria. Not long after the outbreak, Doihara showed up at Harbin and took over the city. Yes, and it was just about that time that he visited Puyi at the Ensin disguised as a Manchurian nobleman, and asked Puyi, in the name of the ancient Manchus, to return to the throne of Manchuria. He went away for a time, and then came back and kidnapped Puyi, and took him across the Yellow Sea to Dairen. The Chinese say he is also the one who engineered the incident of the Marco Polo Bridge that started the war in China, and that he had a hand in the planning of the attack at Pearl Harbor. Today, Doihara is a general. After the suicide of Field Marshal General Sugiyama on September 9th, Doehara was named commander of the new Japanese First Army. And on being sent by the Japanese to Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelberger's headquarters, he made a statement. I will bend every effort to cooperate with the Americans and to facilitate their occupation. He played his role with all the smoothness that has characterized his entire career. But hardly had he assumed his new post when, by order of General MacArthur, he was arrested. General Nishio is another name to remember. I talked with Nishio. That is, as much as anybody could talk with him. He was silent most of the time. Taciturn. Dewey Hara was amiable easy to get along with, in conversation, but not Nishio. You never knew what he thought about anything. He looked at you as if you didn't exist. He answered your questions in monosyllables, he made you uneasy. This was his natural manner. But I always had the feeling he made a point of making the most of it. <laughs> Nishio asked to be sent to Manchuria. He looked over Manchuria as coldly as a feudal lord, looking over newly acquired lands and resources. He saw Manchuria as Japan's future base of operations on the mainland of Asia. He was one of the policymakers of Manchuria. He thought of Manchuria only in terms of its military value and the plan of aggression that he had in mind. Doihara and Ditigaki joined him in Manchuria. And together, these three became the nucleus of power in the Guangdong army, which was to be, in turn, the nucleus of power of the entire Imperial Army. Uh, we must control all the key positions in the government. This was Nishio. Uh, we must have the same complete control in the other departments as we have through the Minister of War. The Minister of War has direct access to the Emperor. And he's the only member of the Cabinet, except the Minister of the Navy, who has this privilege. We must be in a position to control the Cabinet or force its collapse. But, uh, General, I am a new soldier. You have a command, Colonel Itagaki. Use it. Nishio and the Guangdong Army expected big things of Itagaki in the field. They were disappointed. His fighting command in China was trapped, and 25,000 Japanese fell in the battle. I told you, General Nishio, I am a new soldier. You must not think of... No, no, you, you need not try to convince me. My spirit shall be of greater value to Japan than my part. But no, Colonel Itagaki, each of us serves in his own way. 
We are not thinking of you as a uh, commander of troops. You are of great value. Leave the fighting to us. Nishio saw the value of Itikaki. He knew that he was one of the smartest Japanese of the old order. He saw that he had gifts that made him more valuable or more dangerous than a soldier. We wondered what Nishio would do, and we found out. General Nishio has been called back to Tokyo, and Itigaki has been appointed to succeed him. As chief of staff of the Guandong Army? Yes, as chief of staff. We couldn't see Itigaki in that spot, but we soon learned that Itigaki had other talents indeed. He named Kuniaki Koiso to his staff. Koiso was later to become premier. And as head of the Guantung Army's military police and espionage, he named Tojo, who also was later to become premier. Itigaki has changed the name of Manchuria to Manjokuo. So they've finally done it. Yes, and he is going to set it up as a puppet state with Henry Puyi as emperor. Meantime, another Japanese was rising to power among the stalwarts of the old order in Manchuria. Ingoro Hashimoto. Our sublime mission is to dominate the world. These were his exact words. You must take it upon yourselves to chop off the head of any individual, whether he is a public figure or a private citizen who dares to stand in the way of your divine mission. He trained the young firebrands in Manchuria, and they swore their loyalty and determination. I swear to behead any individual who seeks to thwart our mission. I swear to have no contact whatever with foreigners or their thoughts. I swear to devote my life to the Japanese domination of the world. Under Hashimoto, murder became a method. The young officers he trained suspected not only foreigners and public officials, but private citizens. He burned his stamp into the souls of the young Japanese under his command. In December 1937, the Japanese were driving on Nanking. Hashimoto was in command of the shore batteries along the Yangtze. There are still some foreign ships in the river there below us, Colonel Hashimoto. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, what is that gunboat down there, Major? That is the American gunboat Panay. And what of those other ships? Freighters? Yes, sir. Here, take these binoculars. Uh-huh. American and British cargo ships. Yes, sir. Our intelligence from the merchant ships is that they say that the Yancey is not a Japanese dream. And they will not leave until they have completed their business. Our orders are to clear the river of shipping. Does that mean Chinese shipping or all shipping? The order says clear the river of shipping. Take the necessary action, Major. Use airplanes and ashore batteries. With that order, Colonel Kingoro Hashimoto made history. The of the Panay brought Japan to the brink of war with the United States. This frightened many Japanese, even the most ardent militarists. This was not the time for Japan to be precipitated into war with the United States. Japan was not ready. The incident was closed. But among the militarists, Ashimoto had won high regard. Hereafter, he was to be important. Meantime, Itagaki's work in Manchuria had been outstanding. He was called back to Tokyo to become Minister of War, and he called back Tojo, made him Vice Minister of War, and requested him to carry on in Japan the same sort of policing and espionage that he had directed so well in Manchuria. And one day, Tojo's espionage dragnet came up with a bigger catch than he had ever bargained for. They parted to murder Admiral Yonai. Admiral Yonai? The Premier? Yes. They were all ready to strike when we took them. They are now in jail. All of them? All except the leader. Who is he? Hashimoto. Hashimoto? Admiral Yonai, the premier, learned that Hashimoto, whom he knew well, was the arch-conspirator. Yonai was uneasy for days. But Hashimoto walked around scot-free. Well, nine days later, the resignation of Yonai was announced. We all kept close watch to see what would be done about Hashimoto. 
wasn't long before Prince Konoi issued a statement. Uh, therefore, by direction, Ingoro Hashimoto is named head of the committee to draft the new political and economic structure of Greater Japan. The direction of the committee will be in the hands of Hashimoto. And he will, of course... This was the old order. Konoi was premier. But the power behind the throne was the army clique. Nishio and Itikaki still pulled the strings. By 1941, they had worked together for ten years. And when Kanoya's government fell, they made their influence tell. Uh, we must see that a premier is appointed whom we can trust uh, without question of doubt. It uh, must uh, be a man uh, strong enough to control the cabinet. Whom uh, uh, do you have in mind? It can only be Hideki Tojo. Tojo became premier. By a special act of the emperor, he retained his post as army chief of staff. It was Tojo who took Japan into the war against the United States, the crowning achievement of the old order. The old order had won control of the government, had won the approval of the emperor to have a premier who was also chief of staff, and was able to announce, as Tojo did to the Japanese empire on the day of Pearl Harbor, that... The emperor has declared war on the United States and Greater Britain. Tojo had come up through the ranks of the old order, as the other warmakers had. He indoctrinated the army with his hate. He gave his soldiers something to shoot at. Japan is determined to destroy the United States and Britain. Tojo did his utmost for nearly three years. But even when his cabinet fell, another disciple of the old order, the man Tojo had made a member of his staff back in the days of the Manchurian adventure, Kuniaki Kuiso, was named to succeed him as premier. The old order was still in power. Kuniaki Koiso was no different from the others. He had been chief secretary to the Supreme War Council, vice minister of war, and governor of Korea. He surrounded himself with a set of the same militarists and bureaucrats that had come up to power with him. General Sugiyama, one of Japan's arch militarists, had been identified with every Japanese aggression from the Mukden incident to Pearl Harbor, became war minister in Koiso's cabinet. And this same General Sugiyama was to be one of the first to kill himself after the surrender of Japan. The Tojo government had made way for the Koiso government. But Japan was still in the hands of the same clique. And Koiso made no bones about it. We will further strengthen our ties with Germany. And we will befriend the neutral countries in order that they may offer positive cooperation with Japan. But the old order is not only these men. Koiso, Tojo, Itagaki, Nishio, Hashimoto, Doehara, Araki, and men like that. But it is also Korea soldiers like Tomoyuki Yamashita and Korea diplomats like Mamora Shigemitsu. It is these men and all the men like them and the institutions they have used that is the menace of the old order. <laughs> The Privy Council is one of the institutions of the old order. It is a telling force in Japanese affairs. During the war, there were 20 members in the Privy Council. These are the words of Admiral Nomura, who was in Washington, D.C. at the time of Pearl Harbor, and who was a member of the council. The Privy Council is composed of yes-men. But yes-men for whom? <laughs> Well, the Privy Council is composed of important generals, admirals, important politicians, and a few civilian experts in various fields. I asked the Japanese how the members were selected. They are chosen by the Premier. Well, that means the Premier can uh, pretty well choose the men he wants. Hmm? He must consult the court advisors, of course, and the Cabinet and the Privy Council itself. Then the men in power have control over the Privy Council. In the sense that they can control its membership, yes. Uh, now, would that mean that if a general were premier, that the Privy Council might be inclined to be, well, uh, pro-army? The Privy Council has been pro-army for years. The Privy Council is the instrument of the Japanese in power. Its formal reason for being is to advise the emperor on state affairs and to advise the premier and his cabinet. But the members of the council being hand-picked give the kind of advice the men in power wish. This is the explanation of Admiral Nomura's statement. The Privy Council is composed of yes-men. The Emperor calls the council to session at the request of the Premier. And to itself, the council arrogates certain prerogatives, as in the matter of the 5-5-3 naval ratio in the London Treaty of 1930. Premier Hamaguchi, 
Is it true that you have accepted the 553 naval ratio? Uh, yeah, it is true. Japan's naval strength will be limited in the ratio of 3 to 5. 3 for Japan and 5 each for the United States and Britain. It is an outrage. How dare the civil authority defy the army and navy on matters of national defense? The people of Japan and the press of Japan are behind us. You have exceeded your powers, Mr. Hamaguchi. You are assuming that you have the right to control the entire foreign policy of Japan. You have violated the rights of the Privy Council to lay the facts before the Emperor before a decision is made. The Privy Council has still to ratify the treaty. It will not be ratified. It is a disgrace that Japan should enter into a naval treaty which limits us to a ratio of three to five in favor of the United States. The people favored the ratification of the treaty. The press favored it. Even some members of the cabinet favored it. In fact, nearly all of Japan favored it, except the Privy Council. The Council blocked it for five months, and only because of the great pressure for it was it at last ratified. The militarists of the old order were forced to back down, but the old order made known its sinister power and what it stood for in another way. Hamaguchi was murdered. The Privy Council, in the words of the Japanese, is... The highest body for imperial consultation on important political affairs. As such, the war could only be plotted with the consent and the help of the Privy Council. For the Privy Council is above and beyond the common people. It is indeed the instrument of the men in power. During the war, the Council met every week. How often it met in the years immediately before the war, while the war was being plotted, is not known. But unless it aided and abetted the plot, there could have been no war. As the Privy Council is part of the imperial system, so also is the imperial household department. I talked with the imperial household minister who manages the affairs of the palace. The imperial household department, of course, has no connection whatever with state affairs. Yes, so I understand. Uh, but just what does it include? There are a number of bureaus in the household department. We have, for example, a bureau of the treasury. We have a bureau of the forest, a bureau of imperial archives, a bureau of architecture, a bureau of poetry, a bureau of medical affairs, a bureau of imperial tombs, and a bureau of culinary affairs and, and, and so on. And there is a staff for each of these bureaus? Oh, yes, a, a staff for each. You must understand, of course, that the imperial court has investments in various banks and industrial companies. Uh-huh. Uh, how extensive are these investments? Quite extensive. And out of the income from these sources, the households of the crown prince and of all the imperial princes are supported. But all the monies are not spent on the imperial household department. Considerable sums are given each year to encourage art and education, which, as you know, are the chief interests of the emperor. The imperial household department is virtually a state within itself, and well it may be. But with its numberless officials and staff and lackeys and servants, with its vast and almost fabulous estates, the Japanese imperial family is perhaps the richest on earth. And heading this private domain, as well as being the head of the state, is the emperor. And not only the imperial army, but the entire nation regard our emperor as a living god. For us, it is not a question of historical or scientific accuracy. It is an article of national faith. These are the words of General Senjuro Hiyashi, another of Japan's old order. And while all Japan and Japanese do not regard the emperor as a living god, most do regard him as symbolic of divinity and infallibility. Thus, the words of his surrender script have special significance. The war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. The emperor made no admission of defeat or surrender. We have decided 
to effect a settlement of the present situation. The situation in Japan after the two atomic bombs had fallen. Indeed, we declared war on America, on Britain, out of our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation and stability in East Asia, it being far from our thoughts either to infringe upon the sovereignty of other nations or to embark upon territorial aggression. Thus the emperor whitewashed Japan's motives. We have been able to save and maintain the imperial state. Thus, in his rescript, the emperor reassured his 70 million subjects. As the full weight of the occupation becomes felt, the power of the old order diminishes. Some of the leaders of the old order have taken their lives. Others will be tried as war criminals. But the old order is more than the men who made the war. It is also the institutions which have formulated their thinking. To change this philosophy implies many things. To root out the old order, not merely to submerge it, means that the basic institutions of Japan must be changed. The old order in Japan cannot at once be extirpated any more than democracy could at once be extirpated. As for the men of the old order, even those who are not regarded as war criminals, their fundamental thinking cannot be changed. The same is true of most of the people who are led by these leaders of the old order. The start must be made with the younger elements. Education must be revised around the principle that the state is a completely man-made entity, not something having absolute existence above the will of man. The people must have the opportunity to learn that the sovereign right is not a mystic and transcendent power that has been inherited from ancestral gods. The people must be educated to know that the sovereign right is owned by the people themselves and must be administered by the will of the people. This is the opinion of an American educator. And because of the price the United States has paid in the Pacific and the concern of the American people for the future of the Pacific, the opinions of Americans as to Japan are now crystallizing into definite form. The Privy Council should be abolished. It should be ended completely. The Imperial Household Department should be abolished, and only a small secretarial staff furnished the throne. The theory and practice of government, which places the emperor above all law, must be completely eliminated. These are the opinions of informed Americans. This much is sure. You'll never eliminate the danger of Japan until you eliminate Japan's old order. That means the men who have shaped the government's policies and controlled the military, the Tsaibatsu, the clique of powerful families that have been running Japan's industry and commerce, the Shinto Code, and the emperor and all he stands for. The peace in the Pacific, and perhaps of the world, is linked directly with what happens to Japan's old order. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. 
programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.